Hi everyone, and hope you're all well. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Wide Days event, COVID Approaches for the Future. I'm your moderator today. I'm Arusa Qureshi. I'm a writer and editor based in Edinburgh with a focus on music, um, diversity and accessibility in arts and culture. And over the next hour, a half hour, we're gonna be looking at how events of the past year have led to the use of new technologies and new approaches in the industry. So we've got a really wonderful selection of panelists today who are gonna be giving their unique perspectives on the development of this in the future. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Scott, Marlene, Red Rackham, aka Daddy, and Jim. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. I'm just gonna briefly introduce all of you. Um, so I'll start with Scott. Scott Cohen is Chief Innovation Officer, Recorded Music for Warner Music Group. In his role, he works closely with members of Warner's senior management team to help chart the long-term course of the company at the intersection of music, technology, and culture. Marlene Hulbrock heads up Music Alley's marketing services department, supporting management and label clients across various music markets and all things digital marketing. She's also part of Music Alley's training team, where she develops and delivers digital marketing training to a wide range of industry clients, such as members of the MMF and BPI. Red Rackham and Danny's musical meanderings have seen him journey through various sounds and genres, um, from hip hop roots to drumming in bands, raved up drum and bass, idiosyncratic house, and far beyond. He's lived in some of the UK's most vibrant cities, soaking up sonics while honing his DJ and production skills as his career steadily evolved through grassroots themes. And last but not least, Jim Mitchum is a freelance tour manager and live sound engineer for a number of artists at international level. When COVID shut down the event industry, he made a career for the into live streaming events and video production, friending the Mill.TV Limited in Brad Bradford, which is a music specialist online event studio, VFX facility, and hybrid ticketing companies. So welcome panel, and thank you so much for joining me. As as you can see, some really knowledgeable, wonderful people today. Um, so the pandemic has led to a whole range of technologies and new approaches to promoting music and artists from online listening parties to tours of campsites. And we're now coming back to a place of normalcy in that events are starting to happen again and plans are being made. But of those new approaches, which are likely to continue when the world reopens? How could they develop? And how will they be integrated into release campaigns, gigs and festivals in the future? So lots of big questions that are hopefully gonna be answering um, through the course of this panel. Um, and I'd like to start by asking, I guess the panel more generally about their their own use of new technologies and new approaches in the past year. And I'll maybe start with Scott. Um, can you give us an insight into Warner's approach and? what new technologies are you working in, into campaigns or what most excited about? Well, I, you know, what's interesting is I'm not so sure that it's about new technologies as much as what COVID-19 did was accelerate what we've already been doing. Um, everything from like the video calls we, we do amongst ourselves, um, they've always existed. It's just now this is the primary form to, to things like, you know, online concerts that it's not a new thing. It's just accelerated uh, the, the, the expansion of it. Um, maybe the new, new things that, that, that never existed were, were some of the things happening on gaming platforms like uh, Fortnite and Roblox, where there's all new ways of reaching audiences virtually. And I think that's, that is probably, to me, one of the most exciting areas that we're going to move into. Yeah, that's really interesting that you mentioned, actually, Fortnite in particular. Um, I know a lot of people have used platforms like Twitch, and I personally don't, I don't know a huge amount about Twitch, but I know it's very, very popular. Um, I was wondering if anyone else in the panel has kind of engaged with platforms like Twitch. Jim, you're nodding your head, do you want to go? Well, yeah, I mean, early on, I mean, I really see things at the moment as being at a junction that when home taping first came out and suddenly there's this explosion of music being put out all over the place. So I just could take my face out. I mean, it's a bit weird to talk with that on. Um, and so we're at that junction again where the equipment that's needed to actually make these really professional looking, good looking online videos has suddenly become affordable for the masses. And although we've already had things like YouTube for a while, Spotify for a while and all these other things, to get a good, really clean, polished product into them, 
was difficult and it was too expensive for most bands and most artists to do. Um, but that at the same time as all the gaming platforms really becoming accessible, open to use, things like uh, Unreal Engine and Unity being free and open source for people at the lower levels, is there's been this explosion of creativity over the last 18 months where people are doing concerts in VR, they're doing concerts in any platform that they can get to. And it's this real digital innovation that is just out of this world at the moment. Yeah, it's such an interesting topic. I think it was um, maybe Ariana Grande's white stream she did in Fortnite recently. And I, one of my friends posted on it about her, her son knew nothing about her. And then suddenly she's on Fortnite and he's obsessed now. And it's such an interesting way for it to connect the younger generation, I think. And I, yeah, I really love it. Um, Jim, I'm just going to stick with you because I want to ask, um, obviously, you've gone into live streaming. Could you talk a bit more about that and how you see live streaming evolving in the future? Okay, so when, when this first came all came about, I mean, I'm very lucky that I'm based in a venue. We have a venue here with um, space for a performance space, plus there's studios above where several bands have their rehearsal and recording studios. So we were quite well placed to immediately get onto the live streaming thing. Um, and really, we were looking at it not as just a continuation of music videos or something like that, but we really saw the potential for a live performance. It has that energy of a live performance in a venue, in a grassroots venue that people see and they recognize and they love that venue to start with. And we really saw the potential for that, not for the established artists who will have, you know, a, a 35 million pound deal for uh, was Ariana Grande going into Fortnite. Obviously, at this level, that's not going to happen. But it, what that lacks is the ability of a mass appeal. So any any streaming platform like Spotify or like whoever else relies on having a mass of performers and a mass of artists so that there's choice for people at the end of the day. And these big deals with the big performers will only go so far because a lot of the big artists don't want to do a live stream. But far more of the up and coming emerging acts do want to do that. And what it's done, it's kind of shifted this power into the hands of the grassroots movement again. So for the last 18 months, some of the best things we've seen coming out, although there have been some great stuff by, you know, Biffy Clyro, people like that, but actually there's been thousands of smaller performances and so much choice. What we're lacking at the moment really is one place to actually go to to see them all and a way which where we can search and find these all. But I certainly think there's a massive um, interest there and there's a gap there for people to get into. Yeah, I completely agree with you in that it's definitely the smaller acts and the more kind of grassroots acts for me personally that I've really enjoyed listening to and watching. Um, I wonder the rest of the panel, um, Danny, maybe have you enjoyed watching anything in particular over the last year? Have there been any platforms that you've engaged with? Well, I did uh, Twitch every day from a lot of, it was a yeah, April 2020 till about June. I did Twitch every day because I thought I'd try and start doing Twitch. So... And I also did some charity streams, some quite high, like uh, United We Stream and stuff like that. So quite big, high profile ones. So to be honest with you, I was a little bit streamed out myself. But um, what I found was it really built up uh, an audience for me quite quickly. Uh, and I had a community very quickly, um, which was really interesting because, yeah, it was the same time every day. Um, and I found that, you know, sometimes I couldn't face doing it. But when I actually started doing the, the stream, you know, I got energy off the people who were watching and they it really, you know, it was a really scary time last year, you know, when it, everyone lost all their work and stuff. And uh, I sort of stepped up, you know, because I had a room full of records and music equipment and I just wasn't really able to tour. So um, that then led me on to doing one to one mentoring. And, you know, it basically now I'm, you know, I've got a whole mentoring community and the live streaming was the catalyst because I set up my music studio with, you know, I've got a radio mic. I got one of those kind of boom stand things. Um, I, you know, I basically set myself up for live streaming, which then in turn set me up to do one-to-ones on zoom. Uh, and it, you know, now I do live crate digging for my, you know, my, my mentoring, uh, community. So, uh, once a month, uh, we choose a topic. So we've had, you know, kind of, 90s um you know 90s us hip-hop we've had like broken beat we've had you know all sorts it was electronic jazz last time and i just pick out loads of records and we play them and we talk about them and geek out look at them up on discogs um so yeah i mean in terms of other people's live streams uh i did see a few but i'm not really massively coming from the sort of you know big production live music angle so I'm more interested in kind of like maybe the smaller sort of grassroots stuff that, um, you know, so yeah, um, I'm probably not the best person to ask about these kind of massive grand productions. But actually I, I really appreciate what you said there about, you know, the fact that you did that Twitch every day. 
um, yeah. for me personally when I was uh, when cool. I was <laughs> shielding so I was inside for a very long time and it's things like that that really helped <laughs> just made things feel a little bit normal so I, you know I know I yeah. appreciate things there like was that. Many yeah. sunny days though there were so many days you know last year it was so hot and I'd just be like I just want to go to the park and I've got to and, and they ended up being two and a half hours long which is just insane. Oh. Because if people would always come at the end, you know, you're like, right, I've got to go, guys. And then suddenly, like, more people had come. Oh, have yeah. I missed it? And then you go, oh, I'll do another half an hour then. So basically, like, a kind of on-demand company, if that makes yeah. sense. Like, you know, you were, like, keeping people company. And, you know, as you know, last year, you know, there was a lot of mental health stuff and that, you know, for people. So, yeah, it was good for me and it was good for them. It sounds like the community part of it is really important to you. And... I know that you've, you've talked about kind of um, the mentor aspect and how you've been you know, teaching and um, involved in creating a community of producers. So how do you think these technologies will affect um, direct to fan and community building in the future? Right. Well, the thing is, um, you would think that now that things are kind of opening up again, that it would all be gone. But it's um, what I'm finding is I've built real life relationships that are going to actually, you know, I've... Um, I've uh, what have I done? I've been skateboarding with someone from my mentoring group. Um, I've played tennis with someone from my mentoring group. I'm playing at XOYO in London in the beginning of September with Crazy P, which is the closing party of their residency there. Massive thing. And loads of people from my group, well, obviously the UK based people, lo they're all going to come along and support me, which is a bit scary because imagine if I mess up a mix or something, you know, I'm supposed to be like their, their mentor. Um, but yeah, I mean, I. It's a brave new world. But I think that what's really come out of all of this is that we really crave company and, and relationships and technology has, you know, made that quite isolating for people. You know, we're all sitting there just on our machines. I think if we can kind of make that filter into real life as well, because, you know, like when you, they do like tiny desks or something like that, or it's like there's obviously a community online that can be mobilized to enjoy things in real life. And I think that will be the beauty of the future is meeting people online, but then actually doing things like, for example, I make my own T-shirts, right? There's a screen printer at the other side of my park. And every few months I make T-shirts and I put a little silly slogan on the back. The last one was it's a vibe, obviously, ironically, you know, <laughs> it's a vibe. My, I gave one to my nephew and he was like, oh, it's a bit naff because he's only 21. He didn't understand the, the irony. But anyway, but, you know, they are. Uh, I make them and they're, they're, they're buying them off me because they want to be part of, you know, what it's like, it's like your own little thing. You know, there's only 20 of these t-shirts. So I think there's so much potential for, you know, really exclusive physical forms of music and obviously, you know, NFTs, digital, there's, there's so much potential, I think, if you have a community, but the way to build a community I found is to be honest, to not try and sell them anything. It's just kind of like, Hey, I'm doing this do you want to be involved if not no worries you know and and be really honest about the music industry like i'm not saying hey i'm going to teach you how to produce you know i'm like look i went to the record store when i was like 19 20 and they laughed me out of the shop for two years and then one day someone said can i buy that track that's playing and it was like my cdr it took me a lot of humiliation and a lot of breaking down those walls to get to that point so i'm just trying to instill people that you know be real and don't you know don't think you're going to be like the, the the next big thing in one year you know be prepared to work no totally that's great and and building on what you're saying about community actually Marlene I'd like to come to you next and in terms of your work with Music Alley and looking at more wider trends have you seen different places adopt different approaches and could you talk a bit more about what you've experienced um I think what I wanted to say as well is that I feel like that a lot of artists that previously haven't been so digitally minded um, or maybe have been kind of shying away from new technologies kind of have been forced a little bit more since the pandemic to look at these things because they maybe suddenly realize that just because you're, you know, posting three times to Instagram a week, um, like that doesn't mean that you can really create a fan base. And with live being gone, all of a sudden, every artist had to think about, okay, what can I really do to connect with people and build a community? Because um, 
it's not enough to just like post something. I really have to do things to engage the fans and be there. So, you know, there have been lots of great things um, from like, you know, guitar tutorials online or, or Zoom dance classes together. Um, and yeah, I think artists that previously have been shy had to suddenly do these kind of things that they previously didn't want to do. Um, and especially things like what we talked about with Fortnite or Roblox, having these virtual um, virtual shows, um, something that maybe, you know, if you're not necessarily a user of Roblox or Fortnite, um, you might have been looking at it and thinking who in the world would watch a virtual concert. But suddenly you can see that 30 million people are watching like a virtual performance of someone like Lil Nas X um, that is just really, really powerful and shows that there is a demand for these kind of things and um, that it's just going to stay and that it allows people that you know, not ne don't necessarily live in a traditional touring market um, to engage with the artist and um, in a kind of like very, yeah, visual environment. And that really helps to get the artist to be front of mind and to make sure that people, you know, engage with them on streaming services and social platforms. Yeah, you're totally right when you said um, about when the virtual concert started happening, I definitely was like, what is this? <laughs> and then gradually it's just become normal now, hasn't it? And it is partly a process of normalizing these kind of things. Yeah, and you were talking about merchandise and D2C, and just the fact that people are spending money on buying virtual merchandise, which maybe for, you know, generations that are not necessarily Generation Z sounds really weird in the first place, but it's something really, really normal now, especially for younger audiences. Um, and just gives us an additional opportunity to, um, yeah, to sell something to the fans and make them actual fans rather than just listeners. Yeah, and if, if I can chime in, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, what I said at the beginning about all of this is accelerating technology that we already had. And, and one of the things that I think we're still experiencing when people are talking about returning to normal is normal had already changed before COVID-19. I'm saying that this is merely the accelerant. You know, I still think people carry this myth in their head that a few people join a band and they practice their instruments. And then when they feel ready, they start playing little venues and then they get a splitter van and they start traveling around the country and every city they go to, they're building their audience little by little, getting bigger and bigger. But that's a myth. I mean, I'm not saying it never happens, but almost never happens and hasn't happened for a long time, like a really long time. Um, I, I, I don't think a, a, an average person will go to a music venue unless they know exactly who's playing that night. You know, it's not like, hey, it's Tuesday at 1030. Let's go to see this band we've never heard of at our local pub. Like, that's just not normal behavior. So touring for a very long time has been merely the payoff for already building your audience. What's happening now in a virtual way, and it started with social media, it even started before that, but with social media, it's building your audience online, and then the payoff is the live gig. Well, now with virtual performances, the, the, the bar to, to, to get a new fan in has, has come down so low because it's not it's Tuesday night at 10.30 and I have to leave my house and pay money to see somebody I've never heard of. Now you can kind of click and dip in and then maybe you have a chance. And, and, and that's just on the virtual side. But if you look at kind of the hybrid between performance and social in platforms like TikTok, well, this is how it's been happening. People go on there, they perform, they build up an audience and they become global superstars from, from that. And oftentimes the first time they ever play a live gig um, in front of an audience could be in front of 10,000 people. So all I'm saying is the world's already changed. We're not going back to normal. Um, and we've accelerated into this new way of, of engaging with audiences and it's not going away. And, it's time for people to really start leaning in if you're not. 
yeah that's really interesting scott and actually just thinking about building audiences and looking at the future what technologies do you think will be easiest to work into campaigns in the future and how can people take advantage of them and now in ways that could help their career so like what should they be focusing on well well it's always this kind of balance you know you want to go where the audiences are but if you wait too long uh then it's saturated like good luck trying to build an audience on instagram or facebook like saturated and a couple of years ago i would have said you have to be all over TikTok, but now it's pretty hard to build there i mean you still have another year or two to do it but these 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 places get saturated with 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 content so where are the people you know because that is the the kind of mantra of the music business you go where your audience is and so to me it's still fertile ground on all the gaming platforms and Roblox, which is kind of a hybrid of a, a gaming platform. That's where the audiences are. Go to them instead of this old mindset set of I'm going to bring them to me. This is where they are. If you're not engaging with them on the places that they hang out, then you're missing probably the greatest opportunity of all time. The platforms are there. Go. Yeah. Yeah, I really like what Scott was just saying. Um, at Music Ally, for example, we write a lot about new apps, new companies. We're just trying to see, you know, what's coming. And sometimes these companies, they, they start out and then they get to nowhere. And sometimes they become really, really big. Um, but I think it is important for artists to just have a look around and inform themselves of what kind of platforms are there instead of, as Scott just said, you know, certain artists maybe now thinking about joining TikTok, maybe still being like, oh, it's not really the platform for me. Then, you know, maybe it's better to look for a platform that feels more authentic to you um, and that is still maybe smaller, but that has potential and just try to uh, be on there and connect with people there and be, you know, do something that feels good for you. Um, but you still have a chance to kind of stand out from the crowd. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And Marlene, are there any other platforms that you've been particularly impressed by that, you know, um, in terms of the potential for artists to, to reach more people and to empower them to earn more? I mean, one platform that I personally find interesting, but I don't really know how many users they have, for example, um, is a platform called Voisey. So they are very similar to TikTok in a way that it's short form video, um, but it's more about um, creating music together. So and songwriter could go on there, write a, sh a short song. Um, then there's a producer that could like upload a short beat for the artist and people can collaborate together. Um, and there are things like challenges again. So um, yeah, it could become, I think, a really, really interesting platform to kind of build uh, careers for new artists. And uh, Jim, I think you had something you wanted to say on this topic. Yeah, I just think at this point as well, we need to be looking beyond the platforms that we're already about. And this is a, such a wonderful opportunity to create the new platforms that people are going to because it is an open palette. And there's people such as the free party VR guys, um, Lost Horizons that comes from Shangri-La at Glastonbury Festival. They created this VR world and their own platform for people to go to. And those things are now sort of really picking up steam. And you've got to think that things like Instagram, as you were saying, they become saturated really quickly. Well, what has been working, I think, really well is smaller, more niche audiences, but loyal audiences that have something tailored for them and actually built around their requirements and around what they want. And the innovation that's coming out of that sector at the moment is absolutely wonderful. Um, certainly with use of online technologies, there's, there's a real problem with what I call the glass wall, which is how do the audience and the performer interact in real time? And some of the ways that people are getting around that now, especially with VR and things like that, are absolutely fantastic. And there's so much space now for innovation, more so than any other point in the past, I think. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And just um, focusing a bit back back on the mill, I was wondering how you see streaming empowering the mill to increase overall reach in the future. Is, are there any particular things that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, I mean, um, so we're specifically at the mill. I mean, we've, we're have we now set up for hybrid events, which is a mix of online and in-person events. Um, we do realize that the era that we've just gone through isn't, you know, that that's done now and it's put away and it's gone past. The most successful stream we had from here was New Model Army. And we reached six and a half thousand people around the world with one stream from a tiny little venue in Bradford. You know, it can be done. But that's that I think has been done. And I think people have got fatigue of just watching a band on a stage now. 
I think in this immediate period, there's still a lot of scope for people who are a bit nervous going out to watch live, watch live music to have that opportunity. But specifically, the, the massive advantage for people with disabilities who couldn't go to venues before, all of a sudden now have this massive range of music that they can go and see and, and go anywhere. Further on from that, um, what we're looking at doing is actually taking 3D scans of all of these grassroots venues around the UK and taking a virtual snapshot of the live music scene in the UK as it is now, absolutely millimetre perfect. And then looking at ways that people can, ways that we haven't even thought of that people can use that data. So, okay, here's a here's the data of an image of every 100 venues. What would you make out of it? And it might be a VR world that they make out of it. It might be augmented reality things within a venue. So if you go to attend the gig in person, you can hold up your phone and all of a sudden you've got a voucher for a T-shirt that's sitting on a table somewhere. And you're engaging with that world. Once you've got them engaging with it, then you can build a community and you can build an audience and connect people up who have got the same love of the same music. So really, it's not just about presenting things online. It's presenting things in the real world as well and really using the technology that we have at the moment to do that. Totally. And that's really interesting, actually. Um, your point about accessibility, I just wanted to pick up because you're right that I think it's so important that the industry generally just keeps accessibility in mind that, you know, disabled people and people who have had, you know, mental health problems that aren't able to go to gigs have struggled for a long time. And now this has been wonderful. So we can't lose it. We really can't lose it. So, yeah, I think what you're doing is sounds really, really cool. Um, I just wanted to come to Danny next. And I wanted to ask if there is an issue in how this will be monetized in the future. So do you think some care needs to be given to ensuring that artists aren't exploited, for example, with their live streaming of social media? And do you have any other thoughts on, on just income streams? Well, I think what's great about this kind of climate is that it's made artists have to be more autonomous because everyone lost their jobs, you know? So it was kind of like, you know, there was no agent anymore. There was no, you know, people were having to do really kind of, you know, nor normal jobs, you know, to sort of, you know, stay afloat. So, um, you know, unless you were kind of at an executive level, but who knows, even at that level, probably there was some changes. Um, so what I think it, the onus has kind of been on the artist now to try and, you know, find other income streams when they weren't able to perform. And I've seen so much innovation from artists then using membership uh, platforms such as Patreon to, you know, basically open up their world to, um, you know, um, the, the fans, you know, and people that are aspiring music producers or aspiring musicians or filmmakers or whatever. So I think there's obviously been this huge kind of culture of education come from it, which, you know, who knows how great some of it is and how great some of it isn't. But what it is doing is it's, it's capturing and harnessing people's desire to try and learn new things, to try and get into music. So, you know, music producers and, and, and artists offering the chance to, you know, give, you know, get uh, career uh, advice or, you know, uh, music tuition or, you know, help with content and stuff like that. Um, in terms of, you know, it, if it's exploitative or not, I mean, all these things, the, the new platforms, the new kind of forms of technology, they always come out of, you know, they're not coming from a vacuum. They're trying to serve a need that already exists or they're trying to create, you know, a new market by having an idea. You know, I, I mean, I've had I, I've had so many ideas like I, I, I obviously. I, but, you know, it, I'm always thinking, God, I wish I could just be the guy who just says, yeah, let's do this. And then has a team to do it all. Um, but, yeah, I personally and a lot of other producers that I know um, are doing like, you know, they're, they're, they're doing equipment demos. They're doing sample packs. They've they've teamed up with the pro audio companies. Um, I think what's great is it's been a real leveler and it's made everybody kind of realize that the, the, the crux of nowadays being an artist is trying to have an engaged, you know, motivated and loyal fan base for whatever. You know, if you just want to have someone listening to your music, you know, you, you need that. So I think that's something that was maybe a bit lost in the kind of bloated kind of former way of doing music and people like, you know, Rasheen Murphy doing her own stream on Mixcloud and things like that. It was, it was very grassroots. Um, I've maybe gone a little bit off topic, by the way, apologies. No, this is great. And yeah, I, I think you're right that, um, you know, artists kind of doing it themselves, like Rasheen Murphy, like you said, is really interesting. Um, Scott, I think you have to. Yeah, you know, no, I, I was just going to pick up on what you're saying, because I think it's, it's, we're in this phase where, we have we have a huge opportunity to to shift, you know, um, 
you know, as you, as uh, I guess Jim said a, a moment ago about, you know, stream fatigue, you know, it's time to, to, to really get innovative if you're an artist or doing anything in the music industry, because the future is not merely going to be filming somebody playing songs and then streaming it. It's kind of like the earliest days of recording, you know, it was, there was live music, but then when we could actually make recordings, we, you know, think, put a microphone in the room and capture the sound. It wasn't as good as a live performance, but it was if you couldn't get to one. But then over, you know, a century, the recording process started to happen and say, well, wait a minute, we can mic up the instruments different. We can double the instruments. We can add effects and digital effects, and we can add sounds that don't even manifest themselves in an actual physical instrument. And, and the whole recording industry developed into what it is today, which is very different than live. We don't think a record is a is a replacement for live it's a standalone format the same thing with you know mtv back in the day it was you know first there was people playing music on television then the music video came about and then they started kind of doing literal acting of the lyrics in videos and then a whole bunch of young artists of the 80s you know like madonna said wait a minute how do we take the music video and and transform it into something that's standalone, that's bigger than a recording or different than a recording, different than a live performance. It is a music video. It is a standalone piece. Um, you know, now we get into live streaming and it feels like we're just kind of copying a live gig. But as people start to, to, to create around that, and that's the great thing about artists is that they're creatives, that they start to think like those other artists did um, around recordings or around music video and transform it and say, okay, we're, it's not a recording. It's not a music. It's not, it's, it's, it's not any of those things. It's something new. It is standalone. What will that be? I don't know. That's that's up to the creative community. But if you're not being creative, you're not going to have much of a chance of, of, of success in that next world because we're going to look back five and 10 years from now and go, ah, remember when it all kicked off with such and such artist and then another one and they showed us this is how you're supposed to do it. And I think that's what's really exciting again with this new world is, is there's going to be a new, I don't, not quite format, but there will be a new type of experience and it doesn't necessarily replace the old. Live will still exist. Recordings will still exist. Music videos will still exist. And now there'll be this. It's like a process of constant innovation. So like you said, it's not replacing things. It's just, you know, transforming and yeah, adding to, and yeah, it's really exciting. Um, and I, I wanted to just pick up on something that Danny mentioned about Patreon, because I know that that's been a really interesting platform that a lot of musicians have used. Um, I know that just in the past year, I've ended up subscribing to far too many <laughs> Patreons. And it's been really interesting because you subscribe to not just getting music, but in one case, you know, this, this artist does podcasts and they do like behind the scenes videos and they, they do all kinds of stuff. And so it is an experience and, and I really, really enjoy that. I wonder just generally if anyone on the panel thinks that that kind of subscription model will be something that a lot more people will, will adopt in the future. Well, I had, a Sorry, I, Danny, gonna, I, had a meet, I had a meeting with someone offered to help me a little bit, who's a startup and onboarding expert, uh, you know, and they said to me that just to say that they were like, the monthly subscription model is the way to go right now because that is the strongest, do you know what I mean? So they were like, you're, it's really funny. I was thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to learn loads of stuff. And I did. But this this woman was really cool. You know, she said she said basically um, you, you've you're doing lots of things right. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, so, yeah, but it is. It, yeah, it's it is amazing to you basically have to show up and you have to, you know, provide a variety. Like what I've been doing is getting people that I know who are producers, like really famous producers and getting them to do master classes from their music studios, studio tours um giving away samples um stuff like that um, and then now what i'm doing is i'm coaching the people in my group to do their own record labels you know so it's 
it's really you can you be basically offering services or 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 companionship while people do things if that makes sense yeah and I, I like like you said I, I totally don't mind paying a monthly thing for that because it is just you get so much out of it and you, you're supporting that musician as well um marlene did you want to add anything yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to say that i think first of all what we've learned during the pandemic is that um fans really want to support artists um we've seen that with a lot of different things like uh, you know live streams or like band camp fridays fans really want to do that and um, it has offered a way during the pandemic for artists to uh, you know make up for lost income through live so just differentiating their income streams and i think that's important because obviously there's first of all this big discussion about streaming income and just looking at different ways you can make income as an artist is really really important and also that this time has shown us that you know, you don't have to only be the artist that records and plays live, as Scott said, like you can monetize the whole process of how you're creating music. It doesn't always have to be music. I've seen a lot of artists using the time they had because they couldn't be on the road to teach themselves new skills like 3D modeling or, you know, creating their own visuals and using that to show that on their social channels and get their fans excited around that. It's not only music. You you are a creative and you can do different things and you can teach your fans something sometimes you learn something from your fans i think it goes both ways like um you know with tiktok we've really seen that it has come from a way of where people only host hashtag challenges and say please do this dance to my song and now it's really way more about audience participation and allowing other people to co-create with you and it's not just I am the artist, you're the audience, but kind of like we're all on the same level and we can create stuff together. I can teach you something, you can teach me something. Um, and it's just really exciting for everyone, I think. Yeah. And Jim, did you want to add anything there? I'm just going to say it's been quite interesting how a lot of the things that have happened in the streaming sort of world have been instigated by the artists themselves and not by the labels. And I mean, there they used to be the model where the labels would pay for a record and touring was kind of a bonus, but there's been a real shift now to touring being the kind of major source of income for bands, not just for the bands, but for their crews as well. And what we found early on was that the bands were wanting to put on streams, mainly to get money for their crews, not so much to get money for themselves. And it was because all of that touring income had kind of dropped out the bottom. And I think there's a, there's a real uh, conversation happening now about, okay, if the worst was to happen and something like this would happen again, is it sensible for us to all just be relying on one major stream of income, which is touring? which, as we've seen, can easily just go away at the drop of a hat. So I think people who previously would have been quite opposed to change and thought, well, this is the model, this works, we've always done it, and now suddenly have the reality hit with them that they really do need to sort of branch out and, and find other ways. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you there. And do you think that in the future, as we, you know, as, as live events do properly fully return as we, as we knew them, do you think that fans will expect campaigns to include these, these other elements, these virtual elements? And do you think it would be kind of looked down upon if you haven't got that as part of your campaign? Yeah, I mean, it's becoming normalised. I mean, whereas what before may have been just seen as a gimmick is now being seen as part and parcel of the experience that they're getting. And they want an experience from the moment they first listen to a band to buying a ticket to going out. And they want that experience to be a journey all the way through to a live performance or, or whatever it is that they end up with. But that's becoming normalised rather than an exception now, I think. Yeah, and I, again, I, it, it is normalised. And and by the way, I, I keep saying we're not going back to the old way. There'll be elements of it, but it's never returning the same way. Um, but 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 certainly, you know, we have to we have to really get our get get our heads around, you know, what this virtual present and future will look like and you know if we talk about physical merch we have to talk about digital merch if we talk you know we have to think about your virtual you know for an artist your virtual um persona your your avatar if if we have <laughs> if we think about an avatar we've always had them we've had physical avatars you know an avatar just being a way to express you know to the world what you want them to know so everybody has an a physical avatar it's the the clothes you you wear 
says something about who you are, your makeup, your hair. Well, I'm bald, but you know, you know, jewelry, uh, uh, piercings, tattoos, all of this is a physical avatar. So what is your virtual avatar going to look like? You, 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 you must think about that. You know, um, you, you have to, it is part of image. And so when you get your virtual avatar, right, then you also have all your virtual goods and the things that, that, that also become merch in a way that, that, that you can sell because, you know, I came from the era where the, the physical avatar that I chose was around like concert t-shirts, you know, so think about the younger generation now that wears um, the wristbands from all the the festivals they go to. That's kind of an avatar. It's it's demonstrating to the world of this is who I am. This is what I'm about. What are we offering people in the virtual world, the online world? Because don't think virtual as in virtual reality, but just what virtual merchandise are we offering them that they can carry through onto their socials and and into their gaming environments and, and taking with them, um, that's, that's a whole new marketplace that is going to explode because it is no different than physical. As a matter of fact, I do more interactions, and this is even pre-COVID, people were doing more interactions online than offline, whether you realize it or not. I mean, if you had an Instagram account and a Facebook account and you were emailing people, Trust me, you were reaching more people every day virtually than you were ever were in a physical world. But now as an artist, get your head around that. And what are you going to offer um, in that way that is going to go on top of the old physical world? Can I just Marlene, jump in? Yep, you go, Danny, and then Marlene. I just wanted to say that what people chose to do during this time is also their avatar, you know, and, you know, because like, and I, you know, a lot of people got caught out. A lot of people just sort of went to Ibiza for a year. Um, and, you know, a lot of their staff, you know, were really, you know, probably doing, you know, hard jobs because they couldn't be supported, you know. Um, and I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of artists chose to make it about them. Even when they're in the digital domain, it's like, hey, be in my world, you know. Hey, I'm, I'm getting up, you know, it's really exciting when I, where I made it all about them. I made it like, you know, I'm, I'm going to help you. What do you want? You know? And I feel like moving forward, the, the people's sort of perception of an artist is going to be really colored by how they choose to deal with this situation and how much they choose, how, wh what way do they engage with their fans? You know, are they like, Hey, I'm, I'm the star and you're the fan or Hey, you can hang out with me while I listen to some mad records and, you know, like you can be around my house, et cetera. So I feel like that in the future is going to be a real leveler again for what type of artist are you? What type of person are you? Are you generous? Are you arrogant? You know, are you, you know, so it's revealing. Marlene, did you want to add anything there? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add something to what uh, Scott said with regards to avatars and dressing them up. Um, I mean, on Snapchat, you can already, you know, you have these, I think they're called Bitmojis, these life-sized avatars of you, who like a lot of their users, or the majority of their users engages with. And you can now already buy real life brands as their outfits. So I think it's only going to be a, you know, question of how long it takes until you can also buy artist merch and dress up these avatars in artist merch. And I think that's going to be really, really powerful because um, you then have these avatars kind of being the street team for the artist in a digital environment, promoting the artist. Um, and especially on Snapchat, it's so kind of like peer to peer recommendation. So if you see your friend's avatar dressed up in this merchandise, um, you know, you might want to buy it too. And it's driving revenues, but also creates this kind of new level of brand awareness online for the artist. So I find that quite exciting. Yeah, no, I, I do as well. And actually, you, you mentioned earlier about how, you know, a lot of musicians and a lot of artists have used this period to kind of learn a bit more about all this stuff. Obviously, there is still so much to learn and there's a lot to, you know, changing all the time. Do you think that there is investment needed by the music industry generally to make sure that, you know, people do have the knowledge that they need so they're not left behind? 
Um, yeah, I think there are already, you know, like a lot of positive um, kind of signs out there. I mean, most of the big digital platforms have resources for artists that teach them how to do certain things. I think it can probably be quite overwhelming sometimes because there is so much information out there and artists already have to do all of these different things of like recording music, being being present on social media. So I understand that it's quite overwhelming, but definitely the information is out there. I feel like there's never been a time where more training resources have been there. So it's just a um, matter of kind of finding the right ones for you as an artist and what you want to focus on. Yeah, and um, I'd like to kind of ask you all a bit more generally looking into the future. Um, what are the big ideas that you think will be impacting the music industry in five years and what should we looking at we should what should we be looking out for? So if I come to Jim first this time? Um, well, I mean you can never look too far into the future at the moment because things change on a daily basis. Um, yeah, I, I think in the next year or so, I think people are going to need to physically reconnect and I think there's going to be a big explosion back of that. Um, you know, people have been dying to be in a room full of people and hugging each other. But there's going to be a, a dip. There's been a dip. There's going to be a little wave of that. And then I think there's going to be a big reimagining. And there's so many things that people have really enjoyed from the last year and a half, you know, looking at the positive the things. And they want to let go of those things. And they're going to want to integrate that into their daily lives somehow and into their normal routines and, and their ways of doing things with gigs. Beyond that, I think really the, the kind of realisation that we had was, you know, the people that we were trying to reach online weren't, aren't people that were previously coming out to music venues and now don't. They were people who have never really come to a music venue. Um, and so we really want to go into their world, into their digital world, get them and bring them, drag them into the real world, as opposed to the other way around, which is people are kind of focused on a lot, which is like, you know, oh, people have stopped going to gigs. They haven't. They never went. So we want to make our real-life performances more engaging in a digital way. And I think the way to do that is to really cross over the two, have rewards on both sides of the glass wall for, for attending and going backwards and forwards between the two. And I think that way we can get a really he healthy and positive music industry out of that. Yeah, that's great. And what about you, Danny? What do you think? I can only speak from my experience, which is the, the community aspect of it, which I guess is what I'm all about. I've all, I'm an artist, you know, obviously I've been making recording music for, you know, since like the late nineties. So, um, but, you know, I, I feel like for me, it's all about being close to the, the audience and trying to actually be kind of on a level with them rather than be in a way in an ivory tower. So um, for me, I feel like the, the community aspect of everything moving forward is really exciting. And the technology side of it, um, you know, I'm using, you know, MailChimp, Zoom, Restream, um, Calendly. Um, you, you know, I mean, literally, it's a, a vast list of subscriptions um, I wish I could make music. I wish I could just sit there and make music and, um, you know, DJ. But obviously, as you know, um, there has to be all this other stuff now. So I, I, I feel like it's basically about, you know, it, it's it's a cliche, isn't it? But it's it's kind of about your creation. You know, it's, it's like, what, what, what are you going to create? How are you going to harness the audience? So I think the point earlier about um, artists showing themselves learning new things it ceases to become really about necessarily music and it just becomes about the person being exciting, the person being engaging, I mean, that their personality. So I think that's the future. And I feel like that the media and obviously the kind of the major label structure is always geared towards, you know, trying to amplify that, you know, this, per you know, like they, you know, they're really important or, you know, they went back to their high school and, you know, but I feel that the more the artists do themselves to create that kind of, excitement and you know person the personal touch i feel like that's the future you know yeah i agree with you there um scott will come to you next what do you think what are the big ideas that will be impacting the music industry in the next five years well again i think we're already on the path for it you know one is is you know looking at where are the next revenue streams you know so if it had historically been um you know CDs and concerts and then to downloads and streaming, I think looking to see, you know, how we're now finally extracting money for artists from social media, how gaming is going to be massive and gaming extending, as I said, to the metaverse. So it's not just gaming as we think of it and, 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 and fitness. What's crazy is music and fitness have always been together, but 
in this new online virtual experience, you know, think of Peloton. Holy shit, have we have we uh, taken uh, music and gaming to another level? So I think those are three exciting places where 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 I see the music uh, uh, revenues coming from in the in the near future. And um, Marlene. Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily a new concept. It's always been like that, but I think it's, it's going to continue to be about creating conversation around an artist. And sometimes that's through using new technology as the, the first person. Sometimes it doesn't have to be related to using any sort of innovative technology, but just coming up with a creative idea um, that you can use to tell a story throughout your campaign. But basically, you know, how can you create conversation around an artist? How can you be kind of present in as many moments throughout a person's day as possible? So, you know, as Scott said, like, is it within a game or um, on a Peloton bike when someone does a workout class? Just thinking about different ways how you can integrate artists into these to these moments. Um, and then also just thinking about really the, the power of user generated content and, you know, word of mouth and how you can really, um, again, also like a concept that has been around, but it's becoming more and more important to, to kind of let the audience promote the artist rather than just focusing on the artist to do all of the promotion by themselves. Yeah, no, totally. And just because we've only got a few minutes left, I'd like to close by just asking you all um, a question and just getting a full kind of short, short answer. Um, so what is the one major thing that you hope the industry doesn't lose when the world kind of reopens? So for, for me, like I said before, I think it's the focus on accessibility. Um, Marlene, do you want to go first this time? Hmm, I need to think about that, actually. <laughs> well, Danny, how about you go first and we'll come back? Um, well, I would like to see investment in not just new artists, but in kind of legacy artists, because I feel like this whole kind of obsession with the new, it basically renders the kind of actual content irrelevant because it's just basically, oh, we need something new. And there's just this, it's, it's about basically just, you know, it's a machine. And I feel like, you know, what about all the people who are really good at music who are by the wayside because they're not new anymore. So I feel like it'd be great if there was some investment in people having a long-term future in music rather than being used up and chucked away. And, and the same with technology itself, you know, these platforms, we have no loyalty, do we? I mean, it's just, you, um, Scott, you were saying TikTok, you've got one year left, you know? So I, my value well, I didn't say TikTok had one year left. <laughs> <laughs> so we're a really good partner. I said it's a bit no, no, saturated no. now. <laughs> Scott, what, what do you think? What's the one thing that you, you don't want to lose? Well, I, 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 well, maybe, maybe picking up on, on Daniel, I don't want us to lose this notion that you have to be comfortable with change, that it's always in, in it, you know, technology has always changed the music industry. You know, so if it was in the 1950s, the music industry was AM radio, black and white TV and singles. The next decade into the 60s, it was now new technology of FM radio, color television, and the album format. That was all new that didn't exist 10 years before. Then the 70s became all about portability. You had the A-track, the cassette, the Walkman for old enough people that know what a Walkman is with a cassette. The 80s come along and then it changes again because now it's about a CD, a new format. Nothing, Nobody cared about that and MTV, the 90s, the web, the first decade of the 2000s. Then it was, you know, YouTube comes along. Who needs MTV in that world? The download becomes the predominant format. You get into the second decade of the, uh, of the 21st century, and now it's about social media and streaming, and you get into this decade, and now you have all these other things. You have gaming platforms, and you have TikTok and the rest. And all I'm saying is it's constantly changing and reinventing itself. There's nothing disruptive about it. It's just the music business has been great. Artists and the business side of it has been great about embracing new technologies and, and kind of harnessing it for how we would like to use it and 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 driving us forward so i'm super excited i don't want us to to ever lose that thanks scott and uh marlene i'll come back to you now yeah um i think what's been nice um since the pandemic is 
just the kind of level of support that artists have received, you know, via funds and um, because obviously, you know, like the big platforms and everyone was kind of feeling feeling for the society at large, but also especially for artists who've lost a lot. So I think it would be nice to see that kind of level of support, maybe not on the same level once everything is over, but to continue seeing big platforms helping out creators um, with, you know, funds and all of that to make sure that there's a new scene of artists that can can make a living from their art. Yeah, and um, finally, Jim. Um, I really want to make sure we don't lose at the grassroots level this sort of sense of fearlessness that we've kind of and self-confidence that we've managed to gain in leading on new technology. Whereas a few years ago, people might have been kind of going, oh, Spotify giving us a bad deal, but there's nothing we can do about it. Now, all of a sudden, people go, well, Spotify giving us a bad deal. So we'll build a new Spotify and we'll build a new platform and we'll do something new. And this fearless, especially in the grassroots venues, the resilience that they've shown has been incredible. And the ability to work in a network together, so the Music Venues Alliance and people working, banding together around a common sort of purpose, re-engaging with the artists and giving them that confidence and self-belief to carry on. And I really hope we don't lose that. Thanks, Jim. That's a really nice positive note to end on. Um, and that is sadly all we have time for today. But I want to say a huge thank you to Scott, Marlene, Jim and Danny for joining me and for offering their wonderful thoughts on this topic.